Welcome to Real Foot Forward, a West Tennessee podcast from Discovery Park of America in Union City, Tennessee. Today's episode is brought to you by the Tennessee Department of Tourist Development. Visit tnvacation.com to start planning your next trip to Tennessee. Thank you, Emily, and welcome everybody to Real Foot Forward, a West Tennessee podcast where we explore the history, the people, and the culture of our home here in West Tennessee. I'm your host, Scott Williams. Okay, Emily, before I introduce today's guest, share with me something you have discovered this week at Discovery Park of America. So this week, I discovered in our energy gallery that we have four stations around our turbine that represent four different energy sources, geothermal energy, hydroelectric energy, nuclear energy, and ancient solar energy. That is um, very interesting and a topic that we here at Discovery Park have been playing around with. Um, We're putting in some uh, electric car chargers coming up here soon. So uh, a lot of uh, uh, energy topics. So thank you for sharing that with us, Emily. So today's uh, guest, I'm very excited. I've gotten to know him a little bit, but I'm really excited to get to know him even more is Dr. Ahmad Tatunchi, the Dean of College of Business and Global Affairs at the University of Tennessee at Martin. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Scott. It is an honor to be invited, and it is a pleasure to have the opportunity to talk with you. Thank you. Well, so um, we'll start off, as they say, you're not from around here, are you? So tell us a little bit about where you came from and and where you grew up. Um, I was born in northern part of Iran. I'm Persian originally. Uh, Northern part of Iran is, in fact, southern part of um, Russia. And the Caspian Sea is in between two countries. So I grew grew up uh, uh, in the coast of Caspian Sea um, and lovely, lovely environment. Um, I finished my undergraduate degree in business administration in one of the colleges in north of Iran. And then I came to the United States uh, for my master's degree. When I completed my master's degree, um, I went back. Um, it was my intention to work and to, to start my family and be there. Uh, however, that happened to be about the time that the Islamic revolution took place in Iran. When Shah was in Iran, during my college time, we were very, very Americanized. We were watching American movies listening to American songs and everything. So when I returned, uh, it was a turmoil. The country was in a terrible, terrible shape. And uh, there was demonstrations um, all over the country, um, burning um, old tires and buildings. And uh, it it was very, very uncomfortable. So um, my father uh, suggested for me to return to the United States for uh, for my PhD. I told him, I said that it's expensive uh, in the United States to, to earn your PhD. I know I can do it, but I, I don't know if we can afford it. Uh, at the time, my older sister was the first member of the family who got a job as a teacher. And she said that between dad and I, we'll take care of that for you. And I said, okay. So luckily, before I returned, I obtained my I-20 from the immigration office just in case for my PhD program. So I had my I-20. Um, my passport had a valid visa. So I returned. I returned. I started my PhD. Um, in the second year, I started working. And then I called my dad and my sister and said, you don't have to send me any more money. My father said, are you sure? My sister, I said, yes, yes. It's not easy, but I can manage. Thank you so much. Because I really felt guilty during the time that they were working hard, uh, sending me money. 
And what, so, what did your dad do for a living? What was his uh, job? He, he was, um, he, he worked for the Ministry of Economics, Finance and Economics during the Shah regime. Then after Islamic Revolution, he retired. But he worked for two or three years after I came for my PhD. Then he retired, yes. So um, actually, uh, we were not doing well economically uh, as a family. I grew up in a household environment with no running water, let alone hot water, no television, no telephone, no refrigerator, and um, five brothers and sisters sleeping in one room um, all the way until I was 14 years old. And then things started getting better. And uh, so I, uh, I, I asked them not to send me any more money. And uh, they said, okay, but if you need um, money, don't hesitate to ask. I said, I will. Thank you so much. So I continued my education, got my PhD, and uh, had an offer um, from Frostburg State University in Maryland uh, to teach as an assistant professor in 1989. It was fall 1989, long time ago. So I started teaching. Um, and then after 12 years, um, my, my colleagues asked me to, to, to become chair of the department of management. Uh, first of all, for the first 12 years, they kept asking me, I said, no, I'm not ready. I'm not ready for administration. I will not go for any position unless I'm ready for that position. I do feel that I have the capabilities, the skills, the abilities, the experiences, the knowledge to do a good job. I was not ready for 12, 13 years. And then after that period, I felt that I was ready to ch become chair of the department. I became chair of the department of management for, for five years. Then uh, I was asked by my a former dean my mentor, my big brother, the co-author of the book that we wrote together, he asked me if I would become his associate dean. So I accepted and I said, I'll be honored to. I became his associate dean. And then after one year, he came to my office and he said, Ahmad, guess what? I said, yes, sir. He said, I accepted an offer to be dean of the Mississippi State University. And I, I was so happy for him, but I was so unhappy for me and for the college that in all honesty, I had tears in my eyes when he told me that because he and I were so close. Um, and then he said, I have another news to share with you. I said, yes, sir. He said, I recommend it for you to become the interim dean of the college. I said, Danny, I'm honored. Thank you so much. I became interim dean. Within a year, they opened the search to make the longest story short. I went through the national search and uh, I was uh, by majority, a great majority votes of my colleagues. I started um, my service as dean of the College of Business at Frostburg State University. Then after five years as a dean, I was elected through an internal search by majority of votes to serve as an interim provost Vice President of Academic Affairs. I did it for a couple of years, but I, I told them that that was temporary. I won't be able to stay for a long time. Uh, at the time, Danny Arnold went to Orlando, Florida to be um, chair of the Department of International Studies. And uh, then he moved to Spokane, Washington to be dean of East uh, College of Business at Eastern Washington University. He said, Ahmad, I'm retiring. Would you consider coming to Washington? I said, Danny, from Frostburg, Maryland to Spokane, Washington, big change for me. And at the time, I, I had been at Frostburg State University for 28 years. And I said, after 28 years, Danny, I'm not sure if I'm ready for a change. He said, this college needs you because they are going for, your, for their AACSP accredit accreditation and they need your help. And I said, let me consult with my wife and my daughter because I couldn't do anything without consulting with them because their happiness, their security, their safety comes first, then everything else. So I talked with them. Both of them said, could be a good change for you, new challenges, meeting new people, 
I said, okay, so I applied. Uh, I was hired to become dean of the College of Business at Eastern Washington University in Spokane, Washington. Then after two years, I took them through a successful accreditation and uh, it, was, it was wonderful. Everything was clicking, everything was working well. And all of a sudden we became aware that the university was going through financial difficulties, extreme financial difficulty. And they were planning to restructure the university and the College of Business was, it was part of the plan to, to convert the College of Business into a smaller school of business. One of the seven units within a larger college called College of Professional Studies. That was not something that I went there for. I, I went there to get them the AACS accreditation. I can explain about AACSB later on. And I said, okay, I'm being honest with you. If this restructuring takes place, I won't be able to stay because I was Dean of the uh, AACSB accredited College of Business and this, I'm not saying that you lose your accreditation, but it's going to make it more challenging and I don't want to be part of it. So I um, notified the president and the provost at the same time, very honestly saying, I'm going to put myself in the market. And when I put myself in the market, I had several opportunities. I was invited for interviews, phone interview, Zoom, Zoom interview, personal interview, and UTM was one of them. And I was invited for interviews. When I came for an interview, honestly, Scott, um, I had opportunities for more money and because of my experience as a dean, without sounding like I'm bragging or something. Um, but when I talked with Chancellor Carp, when I talked with Provost Cavalier, then they brought me to meet faculty and staff in a large hall. I felt that the culture was the type of culture that I want to be part of. So I called my wife and my daughter. I said, this, this is the place feels like home. I, I want to be here. And then uh, when the, in, the, the interview process was over, and then interim dean, uh, Dr. Katie High said that, Chancellor said that he wants to see you one more time. I said, okay, that sounds like this is a good sign when the chancellor wants to see you one more time. So I went to chancellor's office. We had a wonderful conversation together. So I left. I left and after a while, I received the phone call from Provost Cavalier, made me an offer and uh, here I am. So long history, but I wanted you to know all the details. Yeah, that's great. And we are all very glad that you are here. Um, you're doing uh, some, some great work already and it's only been what, a year? Has it been a year? A uh, year and a half. Year and a half. Okay. Yes, Time sir. flies. Time flies. Um, I'm curious, back up to when you were getting your undergraduate degree and you were trying to decide what path your life was going to take, uh, what made you choose business as the area that you were going to pursue? Um, my undergraduate degree was in business administration, was actually in management. I, I always had a fascination with two countries when I was growing up. One was the United States and the other one was Germany. Um, because of their, of course, Japan was also part of it, but at the time when I was in high school, <clears throat> United States and Germany were two countries that I had a fascination about their innovative thinking, their innovative approach to life, their commitment to engineering, re-engineering. I had that attraction to these two countries and I always thought I want to be in the United States someday, but I never thought that would happen because I never thought that economically, financially, my family would be able to afford sending me to the United States. But it just happened that when I came to the United States, my master's degree, I tried to stay on the same path, business administration, management. And the master's degree that I was accepted for was management and organizational development, MOD, a master of science in MOD. 
I said, hey, that sounds fitting to my background. When I finished it, then I actually went for DBA, Doctor of Business Administration, which is, I thought I was going to stay on the same path. But after a year of coursework in DBA program, I felt that it was too much emphasis on, on, on profit making, money maximization. I knew that profit is important because without a stable financial status or even making more money, more investment would not be possible. Growth would not be possible. But I also at the same time wanted to have a combination of focusing on profits and focusing on people at the same time. So be concerned for people's well-being, their overall emotional well-being, physical well-being, and at the same time, utilize their skills, their ability to achieve your financial goals. So I moved from College of Business, uh, at the time it was a School of Business, to a School of Human Behavior, and I went for leadership and human behavior. So I used my business administration background and move more toward the human side of the organization, which really made me very happy because as a human being, I'm very people oriented. So I understand the business side of it. At the same, at the same time, I do have commitment to humans and valuing humans, respecting humans. And when they do offer their knowledge, their skills, for the overall institutional growth, I will show respect and valuing in return. So um, what was your uh, master's thesis on? Um, we did not have thesis at the time, but we did um, have that they call it comprehension exam and that we had to write essays, um, long essays to reflect the, the knowledge that we had obtained or gained throughout the programs. But for my, uh, for my uh, PhD, we did have dissertation. And my dissertation was attitudes uh, of college students toward um, the veto power in the United, United Nations. Wow, that, I, was, was, I was curious if yeah. that was what got you on the path to the book that you referenced a while ago which is all about leadership and, and management. We're going to, we're going to um, dive into that a little bit more uh, in a few minutes, but um, I'm curious uh, from your perspective, you've spent a career focused on leadership. How do you define leadership? Um, first of all, Scott, one book, revealed over 300 definitions of leadership, meaning that everyone who thought about leadership decided to make, a to present a definition of leadership from his or her own perspective. From my perspective, leadership is, has a few different dimensions. The first dimension of leadership is that leadership is personal. Some individuals who are in leadership position do not realize the, the importance of um, the personal aspect of leadership because human beings are both rational and emotional. If we overemphasize the rationality, in some situation, it will backfire. If we overemphasize on emotionality, in some situation, it will backfire. So we, those of us who are in leadership position, must understand and practice the rationality and emotionality of leadership, which makes, makes that person. So whenever I'm going to approach my colleagues, those who are my associates, or those who work with me, with an issue that we need to resolve, I try to think of it from both rational and emotional perspective. So when I approach them, they understand that there is an emotional side of it and there is a rational side of it. So the first element of leadership that it is personal, 
Um, the second element is that leadership is about service. Those of us who are in leadership position, we are given the trust and confidence to serve. So I'm a strong believer in servant leadership. Servant leadership, the, the essence of servant leadership is that behind every behavior is an attitude. Behind every culture is a collection of practices. Behind every practice is a principle. The principle behind servant leadership is not the will to power and authority, but the will to serve. So I'm a servant leadership. My definition of leadership is God answering your question is I'm here to serve to the best of my knowledge, my ability, my skills, because I owe this to taxpayers, to parents, to students, to alumni, to regional community, and to the entire world for that matter. So my definition of leadership is personal and about service. How do you, th how do you think the journey that you've taken to get where you are has influenced how you approach leadership and servant leadership? Um, I think I credit that to my father greatly, and I share that with you. Um, it, 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 when I say that, it, it makes me think about him. He's not with us anymore. I lost him five years ago. Um, every time I was walking with him, from point A to point B. Then I was, I was, I think I was seven or eight years old. And I said, dad, he said, yes, son. I said, when I grow up, I want to buy myself a Mercedes Benz. I told you about my fascination with Germany. <laughs> for, for some reason, I, I just loved Mercedes Benz. He said, son, I said, yes, sir. He said, education first. And I said, I know that he said, son, you know, but you still don't know. Education first. Then, then in another situation, we were walking together. He was holding my hand, walking from point A to point B. I said, dad, he said, yes, son. I said, when I grow up, I like to build a hospital for children. As a, even at the age of seven, eight, nine, I don't remember exactly how old I was, but I, that was around that age. I always wanted good things for children. He said, son, I said, yes, sir. He said, education first. I said, dad, I know. He said, son, you know, but you still don't know the true meaning of that education. So, Scott, education in my mind became a key to my success. So I decided to pursue education all the way to the highest level that I could. Then where my passion for service come from because my dad told me and I, it became part of who I am that no matter what people do around you you just do the best that you can to help anyone who might need your help without worrying about what comes after that so my philosophy of life is God, has been be good to people. No matter what they do, if they make mistakes, forgive them and move on. Be good to people and good things happen to you. And it really became a true story of my life. When I went to Frostburg State University, it was the second from the first day I was hired to teach business courses. But I went outside across campus in the hallway, on the walkway, and I saw people. I said, hi, my name is Ahmad Tutunche. I'm new at this, on this campus. Um, is there anything that you're involved I can help you with? And I became friends with people. And then the second year, is God, I, I'm talking about 1990, I received a letter at home saying, that, Dr. Tutunche, congratulations. Uh, you've been given a $6,000 raise. At the time, the $6,000 raise 
after one year was a lot. And I thought it, there was something wrong. I picked up the phone, I called the payroll office, and I said, I received a letter that said, congratulations, $6. Is it really true? She said, uh, yes, sir. Uh, the University System of Maryland allocated some fund to each university within the system to, uh, to give as a bonus to faculty members that they would like to, ret to retain. So this is a retention bonus and the university um, president's cabinet voted that you would be among the three who received this. I said, I've been here only for one year. He said, that's the way it is. So you, get, you take your $6,000 and put it in your bank account. Don't worry about that. And I, so what I'm trying to say is that I just try to be good and good thing happened to me. So that's my philosophy of life. So that's um, the antithesis of where it seems like we are as a culture at the moment, where there's a lot of uh, divisiveness. And of course, people are afraid because of the pandemic. And there's different differing opinions on how we should approach it. Um, how would you advise people who are in leadership in organizations you know, around the U.S.? Give us some tips on how we can survive this madness that we're all going through. Um, first of all, I believe, Scott, that as my father said, um, education. We need to educate one another. And the best way to educate one another is without being aggressive in a gentle way to communicate with honesty and openness. That does not always guarantee success, but it will give us a better chance if we listen to each other more carefully and respond in a gentle and kind manner, even if we disagree. Communication in an honest and open manner. And especially for those of us who are in leadership position. So and another significant element of leadership is decision making, because we as leaders make decisions. So I have what I call three C's of decision making. Consult, communicate, collaborate. The first C is consult. Whenever I want to make a decision, I consult with three groups. Those who know about the situation better than I do, because I don't always know everything, right? Second group are the one who are going, to, the group that is going to be affected by the decision. They deserve to know what decision is going to be made and why. And the third group is the group that is going to implement the decision. So those who know better than I do, those who are going to be affected by my decision, and those who are going to implement the decision, all three groups deserve to know. When you approach situation that way, you make people comfortable dealing with you, listening to you, listening to your rationality and emotionality of the situation. And then I said three C's, consult, communicate. Then after consulting with three groups, I communicate the situation with everyone involved. Here is what we're going to do. Here is why we are going to do it. Here is who is going to implement that. And here is how you're going to be affected by it. And then the third thing is collaboration. I don't make a decision. I say, oh, I made it. Go ahead and do it. I say, hey, I'm, I'm at the front line with you. I'll work with you. I'll roll up my sleeves and get the job done with you. So when you approach that, you asked me about the divisiveness and, and how we deal with that. I think honest and open communication, consulting, educating, and letting them know that their opinions are important, but their opinions are not always the right opinions, as mine is not always the right opinion. So I listen and I learn from you. Why don't we take that approach together? So, um, as I said, um, what we talk about leadership, Scott, is always in general terms. 
there are exceptional situations. And the, the approaches that we offer um, do not always guarantee the best result, but they give us a better chance. So your, your book that you uh, referenced, t- talk to me a little bit about just the whole process that you went through to to write, to research, to and then and then produce and promote. You know, talk to us about book publishing. Um, when I was Danny Arnold's associate dean, um, Danny, Dr. Danny Arnold was was dean of the College of Business um, when I was chair of the department, and then he, as, as I mentioned, he asked me to be uh, his uh, his uh, associate dean. I'm sorry, I think there is uh, something going on outside the building here, if the noise that you hear. Um, Danny, Danny asked me um, if I would do some, I will conduct some workshops with him. I said, yes, Danny, I'll be happy to. At the time, I had done several uh, leadership workshops and development, uh, leadership development workshops. We did it. And he, after the couple of workshops, he told me, he said, Ahmad, uh, you seem to have to know a lot about leadership. I said, humbly, the answer is yes. He said, and I have tremendous experience, practical experience in leadership. I said, yes. He said, why don't you put together your knowledge and your skills of leadership and my practical experience of leadership and produce a book? I said, okay. So he, he said, do you know anyone about publishing the book, I said, yes, I know somebody from uh, Pearson Prentice Hall at the time. It was Pearson Prentice Hall. Now it is Pearson. I contacted my friend and he said that, uh, okay, why don't you prepare a draft? and Let us take a look at it. And uh, I said, okay. So I started writing. Danny started writing. We conducted more workshops and we learned more. We included more. And then we published the first edition in 2011, and uh, it, it sold well, uh, especially in colleges and universities that was used as a supplemental reading. And, uh, and uh, then I got an opportunity to teach a, a leadership class in Bad Mergentheim, Germany. Uh, I was invited because of the book, actually. Uh, I was sitting in my office in Frostburg and um, the, the phone rang. It was late in the evening. I picked up the phone, the, a gentleman named uh, Lehner. Um, he, I picked up the phone. He says, sir, I'm calling from Bad Mergentheim, Germany. I said, yes, sir. How can I help you? He said, uh, we saw your book on the internet on leadership. And we do have a class, uh, a course called leadership. And it is taught in, in English. On our program, this is an international business program. My students are required to take some courses in English. Would you come and teach a class for us? I said, it all depends what time of the year it is because I'm a dean. I can't leave my college unattended. He said, we give you two weeks in January, which should be the slowest time at the university. I said, I'll take it. So I started teaching in Germany and I used that book in my class in Germany. And when my students read the book, some of them said, I took it to my boyfriend to read. She said, I took it to my father to read. So, so the book became, became popular. Then we started writing a new edition. So we wrote the latest edition is called um, Guiding Principles for Leadership and Professional Success, which was published in 2020, last year. So... Uh, did you did you have time to update it any with anything you've learned or experienced because of the, you know, the social unrest and the the COVID and and all of that? Did you get a chance to uh, update it with with some of what you've learned from this? It, it, it is interesting you ask, Scott. Honest to God, I was driving home yesterday and I said it's about time for me to call Danny Arnold and update our book for another edition because of all of the things that happened in the year and a half. The school closing, the um, online teaching, uh, running sky high, and all the issues that came up, the social unrest. The, um, it, it, was, it is amazing. Yes, I'm putting together some material and it's going to take me some time because at this time I am working with my colleagues 
faculty and staff and students uh, to put together our st the newly developed strategic plan and also align our college's culture, operations, values, principles, curriculum, make them in alignment with new AACSB standards. So, um, uh, but it's going to take me some time to answer the short answer to your question. Yes, sir. We're putting together some material to, to publish the new edition of the book. Fantastic. We're going we're gonna to take a quick break. And when we get back, I'm going to ask you about living in Northwest Tennessee. Okay. <laughs> Looking for a family friendly vacation destination? The new Tennessee vacation planning guide is out now and it includes tips on the best restaurants in the state, attraction information, where to stay and more. With the mountains, the music, the rivers, the food, the attractions, and so much more, you'll find the guide is a great way to get the most of your visit to Tennessee. Visit tnvacation.com and get your print or digital copy today. I hope you're enjoying the Real Foot Forward podcast from Discovery Park of America. If you are, please be sure to subscribe, rate, and leave a positive review on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. Today's guest is Dr. Ahmad Tatunchi, the Dean of College of Business and Global Affairs at the University of Tennessee at Martin. So obviously I moved here from uh, a, a different uh, part of the country, uh, but you really moved here from, from a, a different part of the country. Uh, tell me a little bit about how you have found uh, life in Northwest Tennessee. First of all, because of my job of being chair of the Department of Management, Dean of the College of Business, um, at three different universities. And I was, I have been fortunate, Scott, that all the colleges that I became dean of or started serving as dean are AACSP accredited. AACSP stands for Association to Advance Collegiate Schools of Business, AACSP. Um, just taking a minute to let your audience know what that that is about and why is it important. There yeah, are thank over, you. That's good. Yeah. There are over 16,000 colleges and schools of business around the world. 16,500, 700, definitely over 16,000. Only approximately 750 are accredited by AACSB. That's how important it is. So when we are accredited by AACSB, we consider ourselves our college to be among the elites. Because of my affiliation with AACSP and my job, I really traveled to at least 10 different countries around the world and almost every state in the United States. Interestingly, I had never traveled to Tennessee. So I'm going back to answering your question. I never traveled to Tennessee. When I was searching for a job, and I, I looked at Chronicle of Higher Education, different universities, all of a sudden I saw an ad, University of Tennessee at Martin, looking for a dean of the College of Business and Global Affairs. I said, that sounds interesting. Then the advert, as part of the advertisement, it said that for any information, contact Dr. Katie Hart, interim dean, of the college, who was also chairing the search committee. And I said, okay, I have to call Dr. Hari before I even put together my application. I called Dr. Katie Hai and I said, Dr. Hai, my name is Amar Tutunji. I'm currently Dean of the College of Business at Eastern Washington University, but I'm, I'm putting myself in the market and I'm interested in finding another place. But I want first that college to be AACSP accredited Second, to be in a good location and bring me closer to my family. Because at the time, my family was still in Maryland. They are still in Maryland. And uh, she said, this is the right place for you. And I said, uh, Dr. Hai, uh, where is Martin? He, he said, I didn't know. He said that uh, Martin is uh, uh, northwest of Tennessee. It's a beautiful city. And uh, we are AACSP accredited. I said, great. 
uh, and he said that we are part of the UT system. And I said, that's good, because I had heard a lot of good things about UT system. I honestly did. And I said, that's a good sign. And I said, Dr. Hai, I have one more question. If your answer to my question is no, then I apply. She said, what is it? I said, are you interested in the position? Because I do not want to compete with an internal candidate. She said, no, no, I'm retiring. I want, uh, I, I just want to get this task completed and retire. I said, okay, I'll apply. Make long story short, Scott, my first trip to Tennessee was for interview. I landed in Nashville, rented a car, drove all the way. When I was driving, it was a nighttime. I didn't see much. But the next morning, I drove around and I, I was going to have my interview. I wanted to look around. I found this place to be really interesting in terms of natural beauty of the environment. And to tell you the truth, culturally, uh, I felt what I, when I went some, to get something to eat, when I was in my hotel, people's attitude, the, the, the hus Southern hospitality that I had heard, uh, it was demonstrated to me in 24 hours that I was here. And then when I, uh, when I left uh, and, and I received an offer, when I came to look for a house, for a place, when I drove around and uh, I found this place to be very nice and uh, I love the, the, the natural environment and, uh, and, and I, I love the culture. And so um, I'm very happy to be where I am. I really enjoy it. Martin is a city that is close to two major cities, Nashville and, and Memphis. You're within two hours driving distance to two major uh, cities that you could go for culture experiences, for art, for music, for everything that you're interested. At the same time, living in a town that has everything that we need and, uh, and no traffic, no pollution, and it, it's just wonderful. I love it. I love being in Martin. So what are your long-term plans? I know and I'm privy to a few of the things that, that you've got up your sleeve that you're working on right now. Why don't you share with our listeners a few of the long-term plans for the business college at UT Martin? For, for our college, my, I can say the goal and responsibility at the same time because goal, having a goal without responsibility is meaningless. It is my major goal to make sure, because AACSP recently, they changed their standards, to make sure that the college meets all the eligibility criteria, the three pillars of accreditation, and the standards of accreditation to be ready for our visit, which is around end of 2024. It might sound a little bit distant, but we need to be ready. So that's one. Number two is, it is my goal to recruit more students, but primarily minority students because we do not have many in our college. It is, it is good for us to further diversify the, the student body of the college. The third one is to recruit faculty, qualified faculty, again, primarily minority faculty because we do have international faculty members, but we do not have minority faculty, faculty member like Hispanic or African-American. That's it. But the major goal that I have, it is my dream actually, you're aware of that, is uh, to at least do a groundbreaking for a new building for the College of Business and Global Affairs before I retire. And uh, we, I'm so fortunate. I am so fortunate and so great, so blessed to be surrounded by advisory board members who are fully dedicated, committed to our college and to our goals. Faculty and staff who are so dedicated, so committed. We have fantastic students. So everything is in place, Scott, for us to achieve our major goal of having a new building for the College of Business and Global Affairs. We have done fundraising. We developed a timeline. We are right on the schedule to move on to have the fund that we need 
to get the Board of Trustees agreement and governor's support to put our new building on this schedule for groundbreaking in 2024-2025. And I bet we have some uh, UT Martin Business College graduates, alumni, uh, listening right now. If they're interested in the project, where can they find out more? Um, they can contact me, Amat Tutunchi, College of Business and Global Affairs. They can find me on the web. My extension is 7227. 731-881-7227 is my number, but they can email me to tunchi at frostbrook.edu. I'm at tunchi as utm, uh, uh, .edu. Uh, Again, to tunchi at utm.edu. Um, email me and uh, I'll, be, I'll be happy to respond. And they can also contact uh, Mr. Ben Jones, the development officer of our College of Business and Global Affairs. So before we go, I've got one more question. I know you mentioned that your your dad had been a big inspiration for you growing up. Uh, so now, with all the responsibilities you have, what do you find as the biggest source of inspiration for you today? To tell you the truth, I had a few, um, I call them mentor, big brother, and a source of inspiration for me. Um, my former dean, as I said, my co-author, Danny Arnold, was a huge source of inspiration for me. And he also mentored me and uh, coached me uh, to learn uh, a great deal about uh, College of Business. Uh, uh, my former president, uh, Dr. Jonathan Gibraltar, who was a Gibraltar, who was president at Falsburg State University when I was dean of the College of Business there. He's now president of Wells College in Aurora, New York. And here at UTM, to tell you to Chancellor Carver and Provost Cavalier are two sources of inspiration and support. Um, and and they're like, uh, professionally, they're my Chancellor and Provost, but personally, they're my friends. And uh, I also consider you as a wonderful friend, um, Scott, and supporter of our College of Business and Global Affairs. We have our advisory board members um, as you know, some of them. And uh, one of our graduates decided to make tremendous contribution toward our new building. I'm not allowed to name, but I'm so grateful. And one day, pretty soon, we will have, we will be able to, to share the name, but at this time we can. And as you know, you're aware that uh, the extent to which our advisory board members contributed to, 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 to our college in terms of fundraising for our new building. Yes, there are a number of people uh, in the United States and that, uh, that I look up to and uh, I learned a lot from, and I am still learning. And uh, I, I, I took a Gallup uh, Leadership Quest survey and uh, the top uh, characteristics of me were identified as responsible before anything else. It says that you have a great deal of responsibility you are a lifelong learner. You're uh, strategic, you're forward-looking, and you're achiever. So I have all the things that I need uh, to do good things for this college, and I'm totally co committed and dedicated uh, to this college and to this community. So, so, so I said it was the last question, but I got one more question. I'm headed yes, to the sir. beach in a few weeks. What book should I take with me to read? What's the, what's the best leadership book you can recommend right now for me? Um, it's got one book that I recommend for everyone to read. And it is not a new book. It was published in 1995. And it is called Emotional Intelligence by Daniel Goleman. Emotional Intelligence, Intelligence by Daniel Goleman. And uh, I learned a lot from that book. Um, and it contributed to my growth uh, as a person and as a leader. Uh, it, it gave me a good picture of what life is all about and what it takes to act wisely under 
anxiety producing situations. Because when situations are going well, everybody is okay. We have no problem with people with things are going well, right? We show, especially people in leadership position, show truly who they are, what they're made of, when the situation is stressful and anxiety producing. Under those circumstances, this book taught me how to take a deep breath and act in an appropriate way. I call it emotional self-control in anxiety-producing situation. So, because if leaders don't exercise that, there are frustrating situations. There are situations that would make us a little bit upset, a little bit angry, a little bit mad, and we want to react that way. That book taught me that you don't have to. Because what you see at the moment that you're angry and you're upset is not necessarily the reality. If you step back and look at it from both national and emotional perspective, you will have a different picture of the situation. Uh, like, uh, like, uh, do, you, do I have time to share an example with you? Uh, you? We got all the time in the world. Yes, sir. For example, Scott, if I am a kind of person who grew up from childhood experiences to be scared of snakes, and then that stayed with me. I'm, I'm, this is not true, but I'm just using myself as an example. Let's say that stayed with me until I, I become a grown-up person. And then I was invited to make a presentation on leadership. Usually I go to the location of the presentation way ahead of time to look at the, at the environment, to make sure the equipments are right and all the connections are right so I won't be surprised by unexpected things. Let's say that I went to the location before anyone else and the room is dark. There is no light. I open the door and there is a cord in the shape of a snake on the floor. Again, re remember, grew up as a child being scared of a snake. I open the door, the room is semi-dark, and I see a cord. I don't know it is a cord. I, I see something in the shape of a snake. My immediate reaction, the emotional side of me as a multitude, she said, whoo, scared. Then when I turn on the light, I see that that was not a snake. It was just a cord on the floor in the shape of a snake. This is what my rationality is bringing to the scene. Say, hey, Ahmad, don't be scared, man. This is not a snake. It is just a cord. But at the, mo at the heat of the moment, the emotional side of me reacted in a scared manner because I thought that was a snake. So in, in real life situations, there are examples that the emotional side of me might be too angry because of the way I see it. But when I give myself some time, allow my rationality to take over the national, rational side of my brain says, Ahmad, Ahmad, this is not what you think it is. You don't have to react angrily. So that's why, that's it's, that's why it's good to uh, not hit send on those emails until you've thought through um, I can't tell you. I've typed a lot of emails and then deleted them before I before they got sent. Yes, sir. I did the same thing when I was, especially when I was in Frostwood, around the beginning of my deanship in leadership position. I saw emails coming in, and I said, oh, it, "I was going <laughs> to use words that I shouldn't use." And then, <laughs> then I remembered. I said, "Remember emotional intelligence. You don't have to respond now. Every bad words." you want to use in your email, use it, but use it tomorrow, the day after. You don't have to do it now. The person is not going anywhere. You're not going. I gave myself some time, went home, had a nice dinner with my wife, I spent time with, time with my daughter, returned next day, opened the email, looked at it, and I said, ah, uh, not worth my time. Just focus on something else, which is more positive, like you did. Yes, sir.
Boy, that's great advice. And I have taken more notes during this podcast recording than I ever have before. So thank you so much. I know that that what your words have really helped a lot of leaders who are listening out there and a lot of people who want to be leaders. So thank you for that. Thank you for choosing our community to bring your wisdom. And thank you for being with us today on the podcast. Thank you so much. It's been an honor and a pleasure. Anytime you need me for anything, Scott, you know you can count on me, sir. And thank you to all of you listeners who've joined Dr. Tatunchi, Emily, and me today at Discovery Park of America. Our mission here is to inspire children and adults to see beyond. To plan an experience here for you and your family, visit discoveryparkofamerica.com. Discovery Park of America.